Hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Uh, the following panel is going to be about the applications on top of L2s. Um, and then for that, let me just maybe let's take a round and do introductions. Hi, I'm Marcin. I'm representing Matter Labs and ZK Sync. I'm Leia. I'm um, the partnerships lead at Scroll. I'm Mami. Uh, I'm the ZK engineering lead at Tyco. Uh, hey, I bring coffee at Nell. I'm Misha. All right. uh, welcome all. Uh, so the first thing I want to start with actually a little bit more on the tech side. Um, I think it was Alex at some point from ZK Sync. He mentioned that, like, even with EIP 4844, like, it would enable us to reach to a certain scalability that would just, you know, accommodate maybe 10 to 15 uh, rollups on top of Ethereum. Uh, I just wanted to get your ideas on, like, what do you think? Like, what have we built in the last two three years? And assuming that there's a big demand coming in. Uh, are we still, are we yet there yet? Like, are we going to be able to actually, you know, if there's a big gaming application actually taking off, are we able to actually onboard this without the transactions fees are going high or, you know, any con kind of congestion on the, uh, on the L2s? I mean, the way how L1 is designed is when there's too much traffic, the fees, the fees go up. Right. And the moment we enter bull market, the traffic will be huge. So yes, we will be affected. Right. Yes, everybody will be affected. Uh, for 844, does help a little bit. Right. It moves the line a little bit, but it doesn't move it into infinity. Right. We're talking about upgrading to, I think the maximum is 300 plus kilobytes right. per storage. So this will mean that some of the L2s, especially the L2s that do not have any other DA option, right. will become more expensive. Right. And that's why it's so important to make sure that you know, we do have an option for the customers who want to have a DA, who are fine with paying, with, with having a little bit lower security, but having a lot cheaper cost. Right. But some, some chains will have harder time, I guess, Tyco. No? Why so? Do you have a, do you have a separate DA plan? Uh, we'll use uh, directly the L1 validators. Right, but you have to put all the storage on, on L1, right? All the transactions. Um, so, one of the, um, uh, I participated in uh, I, uh, EIP uh, 4844 design uh, because I used to be a consensus dev and uh, in the past we were planning to do 64 uh, blobs uh, instead of what we have right now. So this is always an option if L1 gets congested to get more blobs. Um, also, on Tyco side, we already have uh, a L3 in testnet since July, which is also another way to provide scaling without being uh, stuck with L1 congestion. Maybe I can also just add here, so I think. <laughs> um, I think on one side, I, I have not necessarily looked at the uh, calculation on the napkin, and I have not looked at the time horizon that yeah. Alex like, laid out there. So, I mean, we obviously we have 4844 coming, which will, uh, which will be a relief, which will make things um, a little bit cheaper. There are limits to that. We'll also have um, full dang sharding on the horizon, so we're expecting overall um, costs to go down, but then also I think the calculations are also made on L1 historic data. We have not yet seen the bull market with like many L2s that also now have entered the space come in. We, there will for sure be more iterations and innovation um, on the horizon. I, I, don't, I don't think that the Ethereum ecosystem will sleep on um, Con, like continue to improve that issue that we're facing right now. It's like, it's like regarding the load, it's not about like bull market or like bear market, it's all about which use cases you can persist. I mean, right. it's like if you can't persist like some use cases, no matter if that's like which kind of market it is, there will be no load. So again, 
it's just it's all about use cases, it's all about market fit for that particular use cases. If you're talking about traffic, there are high load use cases even in the bear market, even right. in the absent market, there are like very high load cases. Right. But it's like data availability, data availability, like programmable DA, okay? Or like, you know, sequencing, block building, block features, auctions, or things like this. So, I mean, it's not about the market cycle. Perfect. Um, so the next question is a little bit more on the kind of like the BD efforts in general. Uh, and what I want to ask about is we have a lot of portfolio companies right now. Some of them are from the DeFi, GameFi, SocialFi, and none of them have actually made up their mind at this point, like which L2 to build up on, right? And then this is, I'm sure, a lot of projects are thinking in the space in general. Uh, from your point of view, right, what do you think are the differentiating factors in general? Is it about giving the grants? Is it about ease of onboarding? Uh, or is it about just like being very immersed with the community? What are the key factors that you think is going to be like helping you in terms of onboarding these developers to your platforms? Maybe. OK, I can start. Um, so I think, one, you really want to make sure that you have the basis covered, right? You, um, that's, you have different approaches when you, talk, when you think about CK rollups, you can choose the bytecode level compatibility approach or language compatibility approach which also comes with some um, with benefits. Um, for example, at Scroll, we chose the bytecode equivalent approach where I just like, really wanted to make sure that it's extremely easy to port over. You don't have to think about like, re-audits, et cetera. Um, all tooling debugging works out of the box. Like me, for example, that, that's just like the architecture approach, but then for me from like the BD team, I really wanted to make sure that like all our infra providers are also there, everything just like kind of works. You, one of our dev world uses the terms always, devs die a death by a thousand cuts. So if you want to deploy and you just like run into issues again and again, you'll eventually just like turn away. That's one thing, but then on the other thing, um, you, you, for example, you mentioned grants. I think we've kind of seen in the L1 cycle that just like giving out right. purely grants um, does not necessarily lead to any sticky um, ecosystem. You really have to make sure that you understand where, where in the cycle a project is, what kind of, what kind of support do they need? Is it go to market? Is it um, a raising awareness? Is this potentially helping them fundraise, right? So it's like really making sure that you understand their, their issues and their problem, be very responsive and um, aware um, what, what they need. And so for us, this has, been, this has been proven to be like quite successful, to just be really responsive for the teams. I would say that there's no silver bullet. I mean, all of us wish that you would say, yes, if we only do this one thing, everybody will come. In practice, it's a sequence of trade-offs, starting from the making sure the devs can actually do their job, all the way to seeing what are the differentiating features between yeah. the systems. And I think each one of our chains is taking a little bit different approach to this, taking a little bit different path, still not going too far away. We're still here trying to do something close to E2 and something close to, L something close to L2. Uh, when it comes to ZK Sync, looking a lot more towards ZK Stack, looking at the ability of people to be able to run their own app chains and being able to customize more things. So rather than just saying like, okay, sure, you can deploy the EBM bytecode compatible, but if you want to do something more, if you're like, okay, yes, but I want to have my own base token, I want to actually have a different way how sequencer works, like all the other things we're not even thinking about, we want to allow them to do it while still maintaining the ZK proof security. Right. So whatever stuff you're doing, I don't care as long as ZK proof is there. I know that whatever you did is legit. Um, on Tyco's side, well, when you launch uh, a layer two, it's basically uh, a chicken and egg problem. You need applications on one side and users on the other. How do you bring applications? Um, as Leah said, um, grants uh, don't work uh, in a vacuum. You need to make sure you align uh, people to your project. Um, regarding this, uh, we are uh, Ethereum aligned. Uh, we want to be a best roll-up so that um, everything that's 
uh, no uh, sequencers uh, using L1 validators as sequencers. So this help for devs that are really, um, uh, let's say, uh, very uh, into the ideology. Uh, on the other side, there are some that are more uh, financially or economically aligned, or they have VCs. Uh, and uh, there is also reducing friction. So investing in DevRel, investing in documentations, uh, doing workshops and uh, helping them. Now, for the user side, uh, we invest a lot in building a community. Uh, Discord, the Twitter, uh, being there at events and being available uh, for people uh, for questions. I mean... Again, it depends on which kind of users you're looking for. If you're looking for, I don't know, like retail folks, then you gotta be, you know, you gotta be just fun, and that's it. If you're looking for devs, I mean, just you can be as compatible as possible, and you're good. You don't need to redo the dev, dev experience, like which we, you know, grew up for the last, which we literally, you know, brewed for the last like eight years or something. You will not do better than what we got in like last eight years. So. I mean, it really depends. It's like, do you have to give out grants to projects which are trying to build an L2, on L2 when it's actually kind of, uh, you know, common knowledge how to build on top of those? You don't have to, no. If we're talking about like giving grants to folks which extend with something, like do more complicated things, again, depends, but it's more likely. So it's like, as I've as already said, like it's, like it's all about, you know, if, 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 if you have a good answer to the question why, uh, it's like you, you, you will get those people. It's like, it's, it's all about answering the question why. All right. Um, I think as part of this BD efforts, the, the next question is more about in the space right now, for example, let's take Arbitrum. Arbitrum has this general purpose L2, where you get a lot of DeFi applications on top. On the other hand, it seems like Optimism is a more focused on building the OP stack, just like you mentioned, right? And then I assume these are two different efforts. Like if you want to be build BD channels for these two different kind of like uh, onboarding customers, it's not the same. Uh, maybe the first question is like, how do you see in the next three to five years, maybe not too far away, uh, where do you see more of the volume happening? Uh, where are you now prioritizing at this point? So I personally think that more people will be trying out things like OP stack, ZK stack, whatnot, right. for a very simple reason. These are like new things. Right. People who are building stuff on Ethereum, they could have done this for the last like five, six, seven years. If you have a great idea, you could have launched it in 2018, 2020, 2022. Like Ethereum did not change that much since then. Right. Um, versus all these new stacks give you a possibility to launch things that were not possible before. Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, for us, where we launched about a month ago, so we're, we're <laughs> it was a successful <laughs> launch. Now we're really happy with how it went. And so and our focus currently is on like building, sort of building a generalized roll-up where different applications, different verticals can thrive to a sort of like create like a level playing field, but also knowing that for some applications, it just makes more sense to have a different, a different setup. Like can be in L3, for example, we will have a couple of L3, L3s launching um, pretty soon on scroll as well. Um, and it just like, yeah, it depends. Does it make sense for, um, gaming to have like the exact same um, setup as, as an L2, maybe not necessarily. Do they need the exact same risk assumption? Probably not. Um, for uh, financial institutions, it could also potentially make sense to like run an L3. So it again depends so much on the category or on the application and there you just really want to make sure that, yeah, you can accommodate to that. Um. On Tyco's side, so first of all, we're not mainnet yet, so that's our first focus. Um, then we release an article about our end game plan, uh, which rely on two parts. One being a best roll-up, so this 
um, needs some collaboration with uh, the L1 client teams so that validators can, um, well, replace sequencers basically and get all the um, um, MEV, but uh, on our side, we benefit from the security and decentralization of A1 validators, and there are more than 900 uh, thousands of these. Then the other part is something we call booster rollup, basically uh, making it so that L1 contract can use L2 throughput without deploying on L2. So, I mean, it's like, uh, first of all, let's say this way, uh, you can bootstrap like new L3 specific for each particular things, but my bet is that the majority of L3s um, are about are all about increasing consistency. It's literally all about increasing consistency and like the throughput in comparison to regular replication, like on you know just L2. So it's like from our side we were like screw that you don't need L2s. We'll just boost the whole little two thing up to its limit. We'll just shard it like print protocol natively, and uh, you know that's what it is. Like with direct access to data, so like folks are also started doing this. So that's really cool. So I mean, finally people realize that it's necessary. So I mean, if you boost it good enough, it should be enough for everybody. I mean, so, so I here I would actually a little bit disagree that. The big difference that we've seen at least is people asking for things like KYC restricted chains, right? So they're not asking for more capacity. They are saying like, cool, I want a chain, but I want to really restrict who can access it. It's application level logic. You can put it as an application level logic. Even encryption, you can put an encryption in there as an application level logic. If you have enough of performance to process it, just use FHE. I mean like, Yes, FHE within the VM, it's ridiculous. Of course, I do understand that. But it's like, it depends if you can process it. I mean, it's application level thing. You don't need an L3 for that. You don't need modularity for that, like in general. You just gotta have enough of throughput on like, you know, just proper execution layer, that's it. For some things, it's not only application level logic. Like they cannot, for example, live, some, some data cannot leave the premise in some situation, right? They have to be like literally- Encrypted. Right. Um, so I think another distinction, I think, when it comes to BDs, so right, right now, I think, for example, I was surprised to see that, I think it was in the Stanford Blockchain Conference, a lot of like DPM projects, for some reason, they're on Solana, building on Solana. And Solana Foundation has this like head of BD, head of DPM kind of department in there. Uh, so right now, there are a couple of use cases we see in this space, like gaming one, DeFi, SocialFi, DPM, et cetera. Do you think there will be a product market fit for certain chains, for certain categories of use cases? Uh, or also as an extension of that question, which ones are you prioritizing any of these kind of like segments? Which ones are you more hopeful that is gonna bring the traction for your chains, basically? So to say it, we, I mean, we hope the whole pie can be bigger. Right, that's kind of one thing that I think everybody agrees upon. It's like we want to have more use cases on chain. And I think that the diversity of use cases will be so large that different chains, different L2 rollups will like navigate into different areas like over time. Right. It's really hard. Like I think everybody would love to say, like, yes, my chain can handle everything from A to Z and also W at the same time. Uh, but we also know this is not the case, right? Cases like here again, we're talking about our chains are so close to Ethereum. There are others like Solana that are coming from a completely different angle, right. like taking different trade-offs. Right. So I think similar to how people are driving different cars today, right. there's like no one brand that took it all. The similar scenario I'm predicting when it comes to like uh, blockchains itself. It will just migrate, there will be plenty of trade-offs of which application will be better fit where. Uh, there will be the whole ecosystem questions of you know right. seven apps similar to mine are there, maybe I should also go there, right. or maybe I should go somewhere else because there's like bigger market there. It will keep changing. So. Yeah, I agree. So, for some application, it might make more sense, as we've like said before. Like I think that like gaming is one, or also like traditional finance. If they want to come on, they do just have a little bit of a different reality, and they do have a little bit of different requirements. So, if we want to onboard those, we also have to accommodate that. And I think 
thank you. And I think um, what we will see, like, I mean, currently it's like, it's, it's like the hot thing to like spin up your own chain. And we have seen, we've seen like a lot of chains also do that, migrating from different ecosystems. And I, and I expect more of that to happen. And I, I will also expect more forks to happen that will, I, I have no doubt about that, but I, I also do think that it will sort of shake itself out a little bit. So we will see some like congregation towards, I, I believe like more towards like categories and not necessarily like everyone just like spinning up their own chain eventually. So I think it was at DEF CON, but maybe at FCC, I heard that Solana wanted to be a layer two for Ethereum, so. <laughs> no, not possible. So <laughs> Technically not possible. We were the ones who tried to do it. No, forget it. <laughs> but what about the marketing? But what about the marketing? Well, that's just it. Like what what everybody mean? is just like, I think a lot of what we've seen also is like high profile marketing as well, like spinning up. I mean, yeah. yeah, of course, but like, come on, it's technically not doable. It's just not feasible. Misha, you're talking about technical stuff. You know, the, the tweet yeah. does not fit technical stuff. Yeah. Just... What, are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> OK, OK, OK. So uh, if we look, for example, at AI, you've seen the boom of uh, large language models. And there is a company in France that's very, very specialized called uh, Lingua Custodia. And the only thing they do is translate uh, fund documentation for um, um, investors. And it's very niche, but somehow it brings a lot of money. They raised uh, millions. And I think um, so. one of the big issues of layer two is liquidity fragmentation. Uh, people will flock to uh, some of the um, uh, chains that have the best network effect, but there will be some very specialized chain for things with uh, high value, uh, like finance, uh, I guess. You want me to continue you know, like beefing with you about Solana stuff? <laughs> 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 well, okay, let's, 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 it's like, let's say this way. It's like you mentioned that, you mentioned that, you know, um, Solana like applications, yada yada. Yes. So it's like, does it does it make sense like for the whole for the whole like ETH ecosystem or something? I mean, that's kind of what we target. I mean, that's kind of the same kind of applications we target. Like for example, on our side, I mean, just get a shit a lot of data, put it into uh, put, put it into a role of specific for that, and you know, be happy about it. <laughs> right, um, and. Maybe the last question, uh, just to finish off. Um, I know like some of you guys have launched the network, some of you are preparing for it, and we know this is like a marathon. It's just the beginning now. There are a lot of optimizations that are coming for the networks. But then what are some of the exciting upgrades coming to your network? What are some of exciting like milestones for each of the projects? Right, so when it comes to ZK Sync, the three exciting things that are happening. So like right now, we're in the process of launching our new proving system, like the Boojum, which allows us to actually drop our proving costs significantly and get to the level where I can actually run proofs on my home GPU, which is pretty impressive. Uh, but we're not stopping there. There are like a couple more improvements that are like still in the research phase and they will be coming over. So the, the whole part of it is you know lowering the ZK proving cost per it. Uh, the second thing, and this is what, what we're launching around now, are things related to ZK stack and hyperbridging. The idea that you can run your own ZK stack, you can go and modify stuff. Like you can run your own small app chain and modify stuff, and as long as you do not modify the ZK proofs, you can still do very efficient shared bridging, shared liquidity within this, within this ecosystem. So you want to hear about something exciting? That's what I'm saying. The excitement comes from use cases, not from upgrades. So, and I cannot talk about use cases like publicly, because. <laughs> sure. All right. Let's leave it to the imagination. Then. 
So for Tyco, well, first thing it would be mainnet. Uh, then uh, optimizing the proofs. So we have a multi-proof approach. Uh, we're looking into a uh, compiler uh, like uh, from Nil Foundation, for example, uh, Risk Zero that was uh, just before. Um, but users really don't care about this. Uh, for users, uh, well, I mentioned Bell's rollup and the booster rollup. Uh, I think that would be um, very, very uh, easy for dev to just like one click on the website, boost, use all two throughput, uh, and done. Okay, I'm gonna just be repetitive. Obviously, we're also gonna work on like decreasing costs, optimizing our proof generation. We're also working on decentralization. I mean, that's like a that's not necessarily a short-term thing. That's definitely like um, where a lot of research is still going in, but that's something that we're working towards like with a lot of effort. I think, um, yeah, all of, I guess like all of the roles are working towards that. I think one of the things that we're making a lot of effort maybe more on like the ecosystem side is to, I think all of us are we're trying to grab Dev's attention of like overall, how many are there? About a, a million. And it has been going up a little bit, like the active monthly users to maybe like 19,000. And that also takes like part-time devs into account. So overall, I think we also have a lot of work to do to then actually reach more people, reach reach those people that work on applications, that work on interesting use cases, that also means not necessarily always going to the same communities. I mean, like here now we're, we're in Istanbul, um, which is great. We have, um, I think we should all make an effort to make also education available in, in communities where maybe English is not the local or like working language. So I think all of us, we can, do a lot more work there in tandem, ideally, with improving our infra and getting everything ready when the market picks up again and will be more stress tested. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's all. Um, like, L2 technologies haven't been here. Like, it was not possible to do and build all these things just a couple of years ago. It's a very, like, a nascent uh, space in blockchain industry. We're really looking forward to what people are going to be building using these technologies. Uh, thanks a lot for all the participants in the panel. Uh, that's all for the panel. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, be because today's uh, topic is related to the application. Yeah, so I was curious. Yeah, most of the layer two, we launched the mainnet. Yeah. To, how to adjust the expectation from the user's speculation and how to launch the main real use case in the uh, layer two side. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure about uh, right now most of the layer two compete in the uh, infra side, yeah, but uh, how to build a better ecosystem and better use case and better go to market strategy. Yeah, just uh, I'd like to hear some uh, uh, different uh, strategy yeah, from you guys. Yeah. So the important thing to know about L2s is that on one side you can just do the same thing you were doing on L1, right? You could take your bytecode, in many cases, or source code, compile it and run. At the same time, it's also worth looking into what L2s provide that L1 didn't. Because there are different trade-offs. For example, if you decide to use Validium, you don't have to pay too much cost for storage. Storage becomes very cheap. Your gas cost is cheaper. You can do some custom modifications. So the way I would say is that L2s allow new use cases, and it's a little bit up to developers to discover how to use them in the best way. Yeah, um, I think also it does make sense to look into different communities. What are the use cases? What are the drivers there? Um, does like stables are huge, um, payments are huge, and this needs to be this needs to be cheap and scalable as well. Um, I do hope that we see with like UX and UI improving and 
a lot of works that's um, going into account abstraction. I really do hope that we're going to move, like especially for these use cases, that these are moving more and more away from the usage of centralized exchanges. So I would really want us to also like hold ourselves to the standard to like push more on that front. I really would love to see that. Um, yeah, and just like being present in different communities, making sure that onboarding is extremely easy, and I think the modularity aspect obviously is, is and the customization aspect is important as well. So I've seen more and more uh, dependencies uh, on the um, application level. For example, applications might depend on Chainlink, they might depend on Live5, they might depend on Lido. So I think it's important for teams to focus on creating those core applications and uh, deploying them so that users can also replicate what they did on L1. Now, uh, maybe we don't have to do it layer zero style and uh, deploying the Lido token without um, the buy-in from the Lido team, but uh, we can discuss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will. Anyway, uh, it's like if we're talking about a strategy. I mean, like, come on, all the decent teams are busy building their own protocols. Nobody's building any apps, let's be honest. There are no developers which are capable of building decent apps themselves. So, because everybody's building protocols. So, stop building protocols and, like, you know, we're just, I don't know, we're just walking people, you know, walking people through, like, holding their hand, like, this is like the only way you can get those little, little portion of those devs which are still capable of doing something, which are not busy with building their own protocol or their own rollup or something else, and to get them to build like, you know, some app. So that's like the only strategy which is viable because let's be honest, nobody builds anything. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm afraid of the, yeah. Yeah, I'm very afraid of the opinion or it's not a priority yet for the application side because uh, from iOS side, we invest most of the layer two, like OP roll up and JK roll up. Yeah, but recently, like, uh, we talked to Arbitrum. Yeah, they just understand uh, how to build the ecosystem is important and then they compete with optimism. Yeah, how to make more grants for the more projects for ecosystem building. Yeah, it seems like uh, no one can reject yeah, for the grants, for the uh, ecosystem, and for developers. Yeah, but I like to say it's not important yeah, only for the grant and the fund supporting. But I also believe yeah, in the JK uh, roll-up side, it's very important how to be different with the OP roll-ups. Yeah, it, that means if they cannot uh, launch any mass adoption apps or super apps, that means uh, what are the difference with uh, JK EVM and uh, which the uh, OP roll up. Yeah? So uh, I believe the next mass adoption definitely will be in the JK roll ups. Yeah? So, uh, but we encourage from the investor perspective. We encourage, we invest a lot in the layer two side, but we hope the layer two platform, they can support more in the ecosystem building. They can encourage, encourage, they can give more grants for the ecosystem builders. That's very important. It's very hard for them to build the apps. Yeah, most of the devs, they will be fair in the short term, one year or two years. Uh, it, most of the investors, they don't like to support them yet because it's very easy to fail. And most of the layer to platform, they also don't like to support them. That means it's very hard situation for the devs. It, in the Web3 space, it, there will be not any apps in the future. That means there will be no future in the Web3. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm a belief, yeah, it's n in the strategy, it, application is not in the priority. That will be very dangerous for the industry. So, um, one of, uh, we finished our grant program uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago at Tyco. Uh, I was one of the um, uh, uh, jury members, and the issue we had is that even though we had uh, a kind of a small budget, we received uh, almost 90 applications, um, and in the end, we didn't even use half of a budget because the applications were um, either too big, they needed uh, a real investor, or they were uh, not good enough. Um, so, there is an issue when you do a grant program with the quality that you receive. Yeah, I would actually agree with that. So you, I think 
don't get me wrong, I think grants are useful if you apply them for the right thing. So if it's like, if it's like research, if it's like, um, if it's going into building something that maybe hasn't been there before, um, yes. And also, I mean, for like community grants to like um, support local communities to maybe run meetups, etc. Just like whatever, um, yeah, makes it easier for people to like meet and educate themselves. I think that yes. But I also have to be honest. For the, I think like in the last cycle, the with the all the L ones popping up, I think we also conditioned the builders and they conditioned like a, a certain behavior into the ecosystem to like now we, we have airdrop farmers but we also almost have like grants farmers that just like go to different ecosystem and if that's the first question that they ask you in a conversation it honestly is almost a filter for us because if, like, when you then ask like, the question uh, I also remember when GMS, one developer uh, in GMS, they joined uh, Arbitron team, and he just applied for Arbitron grant. Arbitron just gave uh, him around 100K, or less than 100K. And yeah. they even uh, uh, yeah, believe the guy will build the GMS will be the next DYDS. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. very random, yeah. But th that's what he mentioned earlier. I think you need to have like a conversation beyond that. So I think you really need to understand what the team is actually then looking for, and if they're genuinely building, and if um, they're they have assembled a great team, then obviously it's a no-brainer to like support them and to potentially also fund them. But I think this like one-size-fits-all like giving out integrations grants for the sake of giving out grants, it just hasn't been creating sticky ecosystems, so um, I would maybe push back on that a little bit. I mean, you're saying exactly what I'm saying. It's like grants is just one way of, you know, holding the hand of a particular team, trying to make them, you know, do something which makes sense. So it's just one way of holding a hand. I mean, you don't have to do that with grants each time. I mean, screw the grants if you can do it otherwise. Sometimes otherwise, doing that otherwise is much more valuable. So, I mean, it all depends. Thank you. All right, yeah, that's all for the panel, actually. Thanks a lot, everyone.